What I'm going to do today is I'm going to, um, in the first part, I'm going to draw to a completion, uh, say a little bit more, finish off <coughs> what I was doing yesterday about the dynamic unity of nature that Goethe shows us and the remarkable transformation it brings about on the relationship between unity and diversity, the one and the many and so on. And then I'm going to make a change to the programme. I, um, what I would do normally, or what I would want to do, is then to go on to the philosophy of hermeneutics, which brings together the phenomenological work we did, together with Goethe's work on this um, dynamical unity of self-differencing in nature and shows how this comes out in the life of meaning um, in understanding. But I feel that um, we've had two days of very, very concentrated work. I mean, we're doing three hours at a time, in effect, or two and a half hours at a time. And I thought yesterday, uh, just towards the end, I thought you were getting tired. Um, or perhaps it was me getting tired. No, I thought... And I, I, I was not tired of a certain kind of thing. I thought, what can happen is you reach a certain point and people can't actually take any more. Mm. And the, it, you don't realise that. It doesn't something like that. You just see that something's happened and they can't take any more. And I was afraid of that happening here because if that does happen, what it also means is it actually is counterproductive in the sense that it begins to drive out what's already been done. And that's I don't want to do. Ideally, after I finish this first hour this morning, uh, one would simply not do any more on this for, say, a week. Then when we came back, I would do what I proposed on me, bringing these two together, and it would have actually sort of settled in you. And you would have had time for it to, uh, well, to settle. And then you would, it, would, it would come out differently. And that would be very good. But of course, that's not the situation we're in. So I was a bit afraid about going straight on uh, to that. So what I'm going to do after this is I'm going to do some work uh, with Goethe's work on colour. Um, because here you can get yourself directly into the experience of the phenomenon. It's practical. Uh, you're going to be doing it. And um, this is, it has an, an enlivening effect. I've never known anybody who did it, who found otherwise. And so I think, and it, it, it does illustrate this coming into being uh, very clearly. I'll bring that out. So it does continue the same theme, but it's not actually doing what I want to do. Um, but I, I think it simply there's this practical factor here, which has to be taken into account. Uh, so that's what I propose to do. Okay? So the first part, I've gone to do some more on what I was doing yesterday, but I wanted to tell you this in advance, um, so that you didn't think, oh, any of you, oh, I've got anything... I don't think I can stand much more of this, you know, um, because most people have a more limited <coughs> capacity for doing philosophical work than I have, and I have to remember that. <laughs> you know, and so there we are. Uh, I want very much, particularly what we did on the phenomenology we reached on Tuesday, I do want that very much to um, be something that settles in you, so you can begin to see in that kind of way. Now, all right, yesterday I showed how, if you work carefully with what Goethe said, and you think it through, then you will come to this remarkable notion of a very different kind of unity, the dynamical unity of self-differencing, in which case there is difference within unity, which within the philosophical tradition is actually unheard of. And this is actually what you come to if you work directly with the organic world. 
although people can miss it. We have the very good examples that David brought, brought up and stem cell and the, I love the fly one and the hemp tea. But the people who know about this sort of thing, they don't see the idea. They don't, as it were, sublime off the idea and see how remarkable it is. So, uh, now, I have a very good example of that, is actually where I want to start, because, oh, when I published, that, that book was published, they arranged a book tour of the States, it was coast to coast, it took five and a half weeks, and I went all over the place talking about Goethe. Uh, and one of the places I went to was the University of uh, North Carolina at Greensboro. Uh, not a place I would recommend anyone to go to, but uh, it was certainly, I don't know, I hope no one comes from North Carolina. They don't, I've seen your CVs. Um, and um, I gave a talk there to a mixed thing. Talks had to be sponsored. And the biology <coughs> department and the Department of Women's Studies jointly organised this because the biology department was able to persuade the Department of Women's Studies that Goethe was a kind of feminine thing. And so that would be all right. Uh, <laughs> it was... Uh, God, it was ridiculous. And uh, anyway, it was in the biology department and the chap who was organising, it was a biologist in the department, who was terribly keen to get into Goethe and he was very uh, earnest and he kept saying to me before we started, you see, that he wanted to get away from this mainstream science. Well, if he had have done, he'd have lost his job for a start. He didn't seem to have noticed that. And uh, he kept going on and on. I was, of course, trying to hold him, focus my mind on what I was going to be doing. And we walked down this corridor to get there. It's a very wide corridor. And on the walls, there were all these pictures, blown up pictures of photographs of, of organisms, and particularly done with microscopes and so on and that. And he was going on. I said, what are these pictures? And he said, no, you don't want to bother with that. This is exactly the kind of thing I want to get away from. I want to get into Gertian work. I don't want this. Anyway, as we walked by, one particular picture really caught my attention. I don't know, I didn't know why, but it just did. I didn't know what, what it was. And I, I, so I stopped, I said, oh, what is this? And he said, oh, you don't want to know. I said, no, come on, what is it? So he told me, and I said, my God, I said, that is a picture of exactly what Goethe is doing. You've got the Goethean stuff on your wall here. And he was horrified. <laughs> because he didn't want that. But what it was, was this. I persuaded him to give me a copy and uh, he was very reluctant. He was a very straight-laced man. Uh, what I think you'd call uptight. Um, he, um, and he said that it wasn't his to give. It was the department's and he'd have to go to the head of the department. In fact, he might have to ask the principal of the university for permission. I am not kidding you. So I, I wheedled and I whined and I this, that and the other and so on and that. And I, he, he gave the talk and he was so pleased with the talk, he did actually give it to me afterwards and say, don't tell anyone. So I don't know where he is now, but it's going to appear in my book. And I'm, 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 basically, it was years ago, basically, it, as Brian Goodwin said, you know, it's a picture that's sort of ten a penny. You could get it anywhere in any biology department. And here it is. Can you see it? That's it. I thought that was... I didn't know what it was, so I asked him. And, oh, well, what it is. It's an electron micrograph, it's an electron microscope, of a floral bud at the embryological stage, a very early embryological stage. And here you can see, I believe, what Goethe referred to as the diversely metamorphosed organ. You can see the coming into being here, because these are going to become the sepals in which the bud will be enclosed. These 
are going to become petals and these are going to become stamens. And you can see there is a bit of a difference already. And in the book I've got arrows saying becoming sepal, becoming petal, becoming stamen, because these are becoming these things. And there it is. That is, that is Goethe's diversely metamorphal. I'll try and say that again. Goethe's diversely metamorphosed organ. He calls it that. This diversely metamorphosed organ. <coughs> Sitting on the wall in this biology department with a man who didn't want to know because he wanted to get into Goethean work. There it is. Fantastic. So, that's uh, very nice. Uh, some people don't think it's very nice because they think Goethe is spiritual and you shouldn't say anything like that. Uh, believe me. So, now... <coughs> now, I want to just... I, coming back to it now, but going slightly deeper, something I really want to emphasise. And in order to help you, last night, at great personal expense, I sat down and wrote out the next three quotations. Uh, you don't need the second two, it's the first one you need. And then I thought, oh, blow it, I might as well write, write the rest out as well. Because I, I know that when I read a quotation, you often want to write it down, and this can take quite a time. So what I've done is I've actually written them out. So, uh, there's three. You don't have to read them all at once. We're going to work on the first one, and this will save a lot of problems. Uh, I wasn't sure the, the last two were needed, but since I was doing it, I thought, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, the title is Becoming Other in Order to Remain Itself, because that, that's actually what I'm going to talk about, and that really refers to the first quotation. Uh, as we. I'm not okay. You're okay. He's done this before. He remembers it from last year. <laughs> <coughs> now, the first one is from a man called Ron. Brady, and I can't give you the reference because I've left them at home. I thought I'd have them in order to save weight. And I've cut the ref there's a lot of references and a lot of footnotes, and I've, I left them at home to save weight coming down. It's he more than heavy enough, anyway. Ron Brady was a very remarkable philosopher. I met him a few times. <sighs> he died, unfortunately, rather suddenly. And um, he was a phenomenologist uh, in America and he worked a great deal on the philosophy of Goethean science. And the first time I met him, I'd given a talk at some other place outside New York, the name of which I can't remember. Um, and I knew he was going to be there. I'd been warned. And another chap. I was looking forward to meeting them. Brian knew them quite well. And Brady came up at the end of the talk. And, of course, I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting what happened. He tore into me like mad because he said I'd misrepresented Plato. Um, I w I'd actually just described Plato in terms of mainstream Platonism, which I've already said to you is... And I knew it was a, that was a misunderstanding. But I said, well, I'm dealing with Plato as it has, has, that has developed in the, in the context of the development of Western science. So that's why I'm dealing with it this way. He wasn't having any of that. He absolutely didn't half rip into me. And I, I thought, oh, this is a bit much, isn't it? You know, this is, this is the great Ron Brady, and this is what happens. And I had to go and have dinner with him on the Sunday night. That was a Friday night. Of course, I was petrified going to go and have dinner with him. Uh, and so, and he was absolutely, totally, completely charming. And I mentioned this to someone, and they said, oh yeah, Ron's like that. Uh, <laughs> rip you off one minute, the marvellous the next minute. But he was a tremendous person, tremendous perception. And he did an article on, the one on morphology, in the book that's now to print. Uh, what's it called? Form and causation in Goethe's morphology. Do you know that article? No. 
We don't know the article. No. Oh my god. I assumed everything. <laughs> 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 I, I assumed everything. Hey? Yeah. Now you can tear into me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian. Brian certainly knew it and was. Uh, oh dear. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy with me. I, actually, I can't find my copy. Um, I have the book. And of course, it's all underlined. And the books are available. It was a. There's a whole series of. Boston series on the philosophy of science. Do you remember them? There were many of them. No, oh, okay. Uh, and it's one of those. It was 18, 1986, and then they said they're not going to republish it. And there's an article in there on causality. Oh, God, on form and causality in Goethe's morphology. It's exceptional. And he did seem to have. You know, and Americans are always having epiphanies, you know that, don't you? They sneeze and it's an epiphany. Well, he, he did sort of have an epiphany with this. That's what they call it. I, I, I call it an insight. Mm-hmm. They, uh, you know, anyway. And um, it's a brilliant piece of work. And this, is, this is taken from that. Um, the way he talks about the dynamic form of life as... First of all, he talks about the dynamic form of life, the intrinsically dynamic form of life, as becoming other in order to remain itself. And then he says, the forms of life are not finished work, but always forms becoming. And their (coughs) potency to be otherwise is an immediate aspect of their internal constitution. The becoming that belongs to this constitution is not a process that finishes when it reaches a certain goal, but a condition of existence, a necessity to change in order to remain the same. And what he's describing here is the very phenomenon of life itself. Uh, And it's a very clear recognition of the self-differencing quality of that, ever changing into other modes of itself. So that what we see as diversity is the living unity. And I've got that because we need to bear that in mind, Brady's way of looking there, (coughs) whenever we (coughs) look at things organically. You see, so far, we've considered only the organs of the plant. But we can expand our horizons. And we can consider the dynamics of becoming other in order to remain itself, self-differencing, in the variety of forms which an individual plant species can take. If you take a single species, individual plants of that species will take on different forms according to the conditions of the environment in which they grow. Changes in environmental factors, soil conditions, humidity, weather patterns, the amount of light and so on can produce really quite marked differences in the external form of plants. When Goethe travelled across the Alps he saw a lot of plants which were familiar to him in southern Germany, but they were modified considerably in that environment. He noticed that in general branches and stems were more delicate and buds further apart, leaves narrower than they were in Germany. And he recognised that he was seeing different manifestations of the same plant, not different plants. But it was quite easy, sometimes the differences are so great to think that you are seeing different plants. This is, this is intensively one plant coming into being as different expressions of itself because of the differences in circumstances. Um, The one is clearly not separate from the many here. That brings me to the second quote. I don't really need the quote from Deleuze. 
multiplicity is the inseparable manifestation, essential transformation, and constant symptom of unity. Multiplicity is the affirmation of unity. Becoming is the affirmation of being. It's extraordinary because it just turns everything we've been brought to think inside out. I put that in because it is it fits in quite well. I got quite keen on Deleuze, and you don't know him, but he was a very famous French philosopher. He died about 1990. And in France, he was a big guy. Everyone's, everyone in the Anglo-Saxon countries has heard of Derrida. But actually, Derrida wasn't really so big in France as Deleuze. <coughs> um, and um, I didn't know anything about him. I looked at a book and it was very difficult. So what's new? A philosophical book was difficult. And uh, I was giving a talk one day and a young woman came up and spoke to me afterwards and said, asked me if I knew the work of Deleuze. And I'd been giving this talk on, on what I've been doing now, the dynamic unity of self distancing in the plant and so on. And I said, no, I'm not familiar. I'd looked at something, I couldn't understand it. And she said, well, I think you might want to look at Deleuze because while you've been talking tonight, everything you've said is completely in tune with what Deleuze says, your whole way of thinking. So I said, you're familiar with him? She said, yes, she was doing a PhD. I think she was Italian. But you couldn't tell from her English. And she spoke fluent French as well. They are continental European. They, they do that sort of thing. And uh, so I, I did. Uh, I, I was in Paris three months later, and I bought a book in the English bookshop there, which cost me twice as much as if I bought it in London. But I thought, this is the place to... I'm in Paris, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I got into it, I realised <coughs> what she was talking about. And then a few years after that, I was invited to a conference at Goldsmiths College called Creative Evolution. And uh, Brian Goodwin was... A, a, was invited to the same conference to speak. And uh, we didn't know. And um, we, we both sort of suddenly met in the same hotel. Um, and so that was quite fun. Mm -hmm. And it was a two-day event, and there were lots of people, about 200 people there. And there were large numbers of people who were actually do, in Goldsmiths College who were doing PhDs on Bergson. Uh, because this particular man, Scott Lashley, was very keen on Bergson. And I should have spotted from the name Creative Evolution. I didn't. But that's one of the title of one of Bergson's books. Mm. And uh, he had basically about 30, 40 people doing PhDs, all of whom were women. And they referred to them as Scots Harleen. <laughs> doing work on, on Bergson. There was, I hasten to add, nothing at all to do with the Harleen about it. That was, that was just a joke. But uh, he, he got his leg pulled mercilessly because he... Uh, all these women doing PhDs <laughs> on Bergson. Um, and it turned out the keynote speaker was a man coming from America called Manuel de Landa. I hadn't heard of him. Um, but people were very enthralled. My God, Manuel de Landa's coming. And he gave this keynote speech and I could follow clearly what he was saying. And I was very bothered because I, I, I then realised when I got there, I, I was actually writing, preparing my talk on the back row of this massive lecture theatre while the previous speaker was talking because I, I simply could not get this talk into focus. And I mean, I thought, oh, this is terrible. I really felt like I, I couldn't, just couldn't get my talk into focus at all. Um, and I realised I was in this situation. And anyway, I gave the talk and I started, and I don't know what happened, I just let go. And as they say, winged it. And uh, anyway, afterwards, Manuel de Landa spoke and said how much he'd enjoyed that. He hadn't known anything about it. And he could see that it was highly consistent with Deleuze's way of thinking. And he was very glad to have come across it. I thought, God, it's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that was it. So what happened then? Since then, I thought, well, this is great. Uh, in the work I do, I always try to accentuate the Deleuze connection. There isn't any connection because I've done it all before I came across this. 
But I thought I'll bring Deleuze in whenever I can. Basically, that's why that quote's there. Uh, but the only reason it's in. I could take that quote out and it wouldn't make any difference. But I'm sort of laying the fact, hey guys, this is what you know, Deleuze does and so on. And part of the reason is, I'm very keen to get Goethe away from the Goetheanists, um, who wouldn't be seen dead with Deleuze. Um, and uh, I... Any opportunity I can get to find some other way of presenting Goethe than one of what's become a standard approach, um, I, I go for. Because I think it liberates Goethe from a certain pattern that he's got trapped in, not by him, but by those who have decided to adopt him as the, the great Goethe, and this is the way to do things, and so on. They have a standard way of doing this. And so this is one way... I can actually, as it were, free Goethe in order to be Goethe. That's my idea. So there is, a, there is method in this, because other people, because the book I've written is not meant for Goethe in the second care less whether they, or they don't. It'll be other people, and they'll see this, and that would be, oh, there's a way into there. Which is also why, now thanks to McGilchrist, I can emphasise the other thing, which is the bimodal brain. That's another way of presenting Goethe that frees, frees Goethe from, from what he's got trapped in with the Goethe in the sea. So that's why that, that quote's here. It's actually got... Not, well, you've got the idea. <laughs> but I didn't want you to worry about why I suddenly um, introduced it. I quite like it anyway. I love it when these connections turn up unexpectedly. Uh, right. Uh, But we've got to be very careful here because we must conceive the plant in the environment in an organic way and we very often inadvertently don't do so. We fall into a way of thinking that would be more appropriate to the inorganic realm. It's all too easy to lose sight of the very quality of livingness which is the organism's own potency to be otherwise. An extraordinary phrase, that. It really does ring. And instead of that, you fall into thinking of the organism as if it were responding in a mechanical-like manner to the influences of the environment. But the living organism, and I emphasise living, does not just adapt external circumstances in a passive way as it would do if it were an inner body responding to external forces according to the laws of physics. The specific form which a plant takes in its surroundings is not the result of external conditions acting directly on the plant to cause the modifications which we observe. It is not I want to emphasise that, not the result of external conditions acting directly on the plant to cause what modifications we see. And time and time again people talk as if it is. The conditions clearly do influence the specific form which the plant takes, but they do not cause it. Such a way of thinking fails to take into account the living organism's own contribution to its specific form. Goethe spoke of the particular, that's the particular one, as being a conversation between the living organism and the environment. Metaphor draws our attention to the fact that the plant is making an active contribution to the form which it takes in those conditions and emphasising the fact that the individual expression of the plant is the outcome of the active response of the organism to the challenge of that environment. So it's not that the environment causes the form of the plant, but the plant itself is challenged by that situation and responds out of its own potency to be otherwise to produce itself in a form appropriate to those conditions. 
It, that's the dynamic way of thinking. And if you look how people write about these things, everyone falls into the thinking of this mechanically. Um, so, we simply have to get the idea that the plant actively determines itself under the influence of the conditions. It configures itself actively instead of being conditioned passively. The conditions stimulate the plant but do not determine it. Because, it, as I said, it, it acts out of its own potency to be otherwise. Now, Craig Horridge describes this, and that's the third. Uh, your Craig Horridge is a, a, a remarkably good Goethean scientist, very alive thinker, who f founded the Nature Institute in the USA, <coughs> which you know of, uh, Philip. Uh, Craig has been here several times. He really works in zoology, and he's tremendous. He works as plants as well, of course, but he's, uh, he's tremendous. Extraordinary perception, hasn't he? Mm. And um, the Nature Institute is a very, a very fine body. And do you get the germ here? Uh, yeah, in contact. Yes. Actually. Yeah, They're well worth looking into. Well worth. And he wrote this book on, well, he's got two titles, one title in America, and one title in, oh, what's the title of the book? Isn't the title the same or the subtitles different? He was very annoyed about that. Anyway, what's it called, Jim? What's the title of his book? I can't remember. It's a good book. Oh, what's it called, Philip? Come on, Philip, what's it called? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> it's to do with genes, anyway. Not in, not in, oh, um, I can't remember. Well, I remember it's going his age, seriously. Things I normally would remember, I can't do anymore. And I mean, I know it so well. Mind you, I can't complain, can I? I mean, here's Filipinos that say, well, he's half my age, and he can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that you're holding a groundsel seed in your hands before planting it. Depending on how when and where you plant the seed, a limitless variety of forms can arise. All these potential forms are not, of course, stored in the seed. The concrete forms are emergent characteristics that arise out of a germinal state and develop in the interplay between the plant's plasticity and the environmental conditions. In particular surroundings, the potential of the plant is evoked. But what appears is only one manifestation of the myriad ways in which this plant could develop. Now that's organic thinking. That's dynamic thinking. That's the kind of thing we've been doing, the dynamic unity of self-differences. And as he indicates, uh, we must not think that the plant is determined by the environment or pre sorry, we must not think the specific form it takes is determined by the environment or predetermined by the organism. It, we must avoid the trap of thinking in a finished product manner as if the potential forms were already there in the, in the organism like peas in a pod, just waiting to come out when the opportunity arose. That kind of thinking is another example of trying to get to the milk by way of the cheese, which eclipses the dynamical quality of the organism being itself differently according to the situation in which it is placed. This, I, I hope you can see this, I think you can, because it is so terribly easy to miss to not describe the plant in a living way, but to do so in an inorganic way, mm. as just being formed by the environment, or mm. having those possibilities already there. Mm. Uh, that misses this key thing of life, the potency to be otherwise. 
well as, as well as the variety resulting from environmental factors, there's the much greater variety which arises from the genetic variation that takes place within the species. And that's what interests the breeder. He or she is always on the lookout for interesting variations which can then be propagated. That's the process of artificial selection that Darwin took as his model for the idea of natural selection. And he was saying that what the breeder does artificially, nature itself does naturally. <coughs> and I might say something a bit more about Darwin later, because people don't understand the basis of what he did. And again, in book after book after book, you can see Darwin misdescribed. So a lot of the people who are against Darwin don't even know what Darwin said. And that doesn't mean that I'm saying... That I, I'm not suggesting for one moment that what Darwin said was the ultimate absolute truth which explained everything. Very, very far from it indeed. But there is something he did which actually does refer to life at a certain level not totally um, and that should actually be understood and respected and it's not done so if it's misdescribed but I'll, I'll see how the time goes anyway this kind of genetic variation breeding is how the huge variety in any one species of plant arises now for example the peony plant Margaret loves the peony doesn't she Yes, she does. Um, and um, the peony is a marvellous plant. And there are a thousand different varieties of peony. I know that because uh, the television was on one night. My wife was uh, watching this programme on the Chelsea Flower Show. For those of you who are not from this country, the Chelsea Flower Show is a very big event, which people go to, but you can't go to it because you can't get in. You have to be a special person to get in, don't you know, because it's so crowded. And, oh, it's the, it's the horticultural event of the year. And uh, so that's it, and it's on television. And she was watching this, and I was, of course, pretending to take no notice. And suddenly I heard some, this person say, there are a thousand different varieties of peony. What? I thought. Good heavens. This is interesting, I said to her, isn't it? <laughs> 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 and, so there it was, a thousand varieties of peony. And they're all here today. And of course, uh, uh, I could have had an epiphany, but didn't. Um, it was, <laughs> I suddenly realised what, what the thing was, that in that variety, that is actually one plant which is intensively multiple, a multiplicity in unity. It's a, a total expression of the dynamics of self-differencing. So you've got one plant being itself differently and not many different plants of a common kind. And we usually see in the downstream way but not up in the upstream way of the living plant. And when we make that shift then we recognise that the diversity of peonies we see is the living unity. That's extraordinary. The unity is right there in front of our eyes. But we don't see it. We just see many plants. Then we say, oh, how can I reduce this to a unity? Let's try and see what all these plants have in common, shall we? Actually, you're already seeing the living unity in front of you. And that is diversity. And this is an extraordinary thing. To recognise, to come to recognise in the organic world, diversity is the unity. It's an astonishing thing. We think you've got to get rid of diversity to find the unity. But it actually, go upstream and you can recognise diversity as the dynamic unity of life. So the unity, you can see the unity concretely as being identical with the diversity. This is not what we would expect to find. That the unity is hidden in front of us as diversity. Extraordinary. Um, and in your syllabus, 
had you can tick it off now. There's one bit Brian wrote, we will come to see diversity as creative unity. Do you remember it's in the syllabus? Do you remember that? Have you seen the syllabus? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you're saying that this potency to be otherwise is taking the plant ever into new areas and yes. new forms. Yes. And then it, it discovers, it rediscovers itself yes. as a unity in those new forms. Yes. Mm. And because it, well, it is always the unity. So because it's self, self-differencing means it becomes... It becomes different from itself but remaining itself, because mm. it's intensive, because it, it's self-differencing. Mm. So when you, if, it's self, if it was differencing, then you would get um, one, and then another one that was different. But it's self-differencing, so the difference is actually the same thing differently. It's intensive, it's upstream, but it's before the separation into many. And it, life is trying to do that all the time. All the time, and that is life. Mm. That is life. When... Brady has this description of potency to be otherwise <coughs> and becoming other in order to remain itself. He is, that simple description actually is the phenomenology of life. Now this, Goethe saw this um, and so did Darwin. But Darwin was a very great naturalist uh, but he then went in another direction. What happened with Darwin was he saw this with the barnacles. Because um, he, he, I mean, he's a very hard-working man, was Darwin, and he was famous in his own day for his geological work. He was not known as a zoologist but at all. And after the, the beagle business, um, he produced these books with incredible illustrations of the geological geology of South America and so on. This is not realised by people today. And he was made a fellow of the Royal Society for that. And he was famous for that. But he came, as it were, from geology. <coughs> but also, he'd had this lifelong love from a child of, the, of, of beetles, insects, all that kind of business, the natural history. And he wanted to develop, develop this interest in, in biology as well. <clears throat> and after he'd finished the geological work, he turned to all this other work he, he got. And I can't go into the details here, but that, when he worked, um, he, he then worked on this business of the variation of species, which had struck him. Um, but he hadn't, he kept talking about this to people, and um, at one point, that was Hooker, uh, chided him and said, you're always talking about this, you know, but you've never done any work on the variation of species. You've never actually done anything, you've just read things up and so on. And this sort of knocked Darwin, so he decided if he was going to become a proper zoologist, he'd have to do something about that. Now, he brought back um, this very strange barnacle, and he thought, what I'll do is I'll work on this barnacle. And in order to do it, he had to collect other species with which to compare it. And so in those days, this is how it worked. You sent word out to people by letter. We would all have, we're dealing at a time where many people had collections of natural specimens. We're now in the middle of the 19th century. Today, it should be impossible. Uh, they'd have some kind of computer digital thing. But um, there you had the real thing. And people from all over the place, all over Europe, sent him specimens which he would then eventually send back, of course, of all sorts of different barnacles, so he could do a comparative study of these barnacles. In fact, so much so, his house was swamped with barnacles. And he actually thought he'd do it in a few weeks. It took, was it five years, seven years, I can't remember. Yeah. And uh, he thought he'd go mad. And it's very interesting because his children grew up amidst these barnacles. And one day, one of the children was in another house. And he said to the child in the other house, where are your father's barnacles? <laughs> because he thought fathers did barnacles. <laughs> well, it was while he did this work that he realised that, as he put it, 
variation is ubiquitous. Second opportunity to use that word. And Darwin used the word himself. Variation is ubiquitous. What that meant is, up until that time, he had thought that variation only happened at certain times with species, under certain circumstances. Perhaps there was some kind of threat. And then variation happened. He did not think that variation was the norm. It was exceptional. And people talk about Darwin having done an earlier version of the theory of evolution and sticking it in a, sticking it in a drawer in 1852. The content of that work is quite different from what he finally came out with. Because in that work, he thought that variation was something special. After the work on barnacles, he realised that, as he put it, variation is ubiquitous. It is the very condition of life itself. Now that's exactly the situation that you come to with the Gertian work we've been looking at, the potency to be otherwise and so on, variation, self differently. So Darwin reached this point. <coughs> then he, <coughs> he, he he overlooked it. He looked over it, went past it. Whereas what Goethe is saying, what Brady brings out is this is the phenomenon of life. This is the phenomenon. This is the phenomenology. That's what you look at and absorb that. But Darwin thought more like a physicist, because this was the kind of way he <coughs> thought in the 19th century. And he wanted an explanation. Now, in the phenomenological approach, you don't look for an explanation. You, you learn to see the phenomenon, which is itself showing itself. And that takes you into something. But he wanted an explanation. And he, he could give, why is there this variation? And he, the, what he came up with was a very extraordinary idea. Uh, and, and this is something which just does not get talked about properly in the books. It is the division of labour. He took the idea of the division of labour from the, the world of the factory and applied it to nature. Now the reason he did that was because he was heavily involved with the division of labour. Because his family, he'd married, uh, he'd married the Wedgwood family, had the huge pottery in Birmingham. And he had married the daughter of Josiah Wedgwood. His wife was a Wedgwood, which is also why Darwin was a rich man. And so he knew all about the, the Wedgwood's experiments with industrial organisation. And his father had been very keen on this. And in the library, his father's library, there have been many, many books on industrial organisation because the new idea, the really big idea, which came from Adam Smith, what didn't it, was the division of labour. So in the wedge of pottery, instead of a craftsman, craftsman, crafting an entire pot himself, it was divided up into an assembly line. So one person did one bit, another person did another bit, another person, another bit, another person. The very thing which we now don't like. Uh, but at the time, of course, it, what they discovered was it didn't half speed up production. So you could make a great many more pots. But more than that, it did something else. Um, <coughs> now, I think it's Adam Smith deals with um, making a pin or somewhere there's a thing on making a button. And there's something like, oh, I know, in one of these, there's 80 different operations. And what actually happened was, instead of one person doing the whole lot, the, um, it divided up into small workshops. And part of the job would be done in one workshop, and then someone would go to it to another workshop where another part was done, and go with it to another workshop where another part was done, and so on. And this meant there was employment for a lot of people. Now that meant that poverty could be somewhat pushed back a bit, because lots of people could have a job, all doing different parts of making a pin or different parts of making a button. And uh, in a crowded Victorian society, this was a bit of a godsend, because it meant your children wouldn't starve. Uh, you could cope to some degree. Now, Darwin was very keen on this idea, and he read it into nature. As one historian put it, more, Brian knew, Brian knew him uh, 
brilliant book on Darwin, Moore and somebody, I can't remember. Uh, 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 now I've given up for looking at you. And uh, he said, Darwin put his mouth where his money was. You know the phrase, put your money where your mouth is. Where well, he put his mouth where his money was. His mouth is what he said. And his money was invested in this division of labour in production line factory business. And so he put that picture into nature and said, in his theory, and said, that's what nature does. And he said, the variation of species is nature's manufactory. Because the old word for factory was manufactory, and then they dropped the manual. And the idea is that nature produces these small variations because each small variation can live in a slightly different way all in the same place. So with the birds, for example, which Darwin didn't do, the finches, but let's take the finches, which so much has been said from Galapagos. They've all got different beaks. And they're specialised for different feeding. Therefore, one environment can support a lot more finches because they're all feeding in the same place in different ways. And what one does, it turns up stones and takes them. Another one can't do that, so it doesn't. So nature can support in one area a much bigger population. And it solves the population problem. And this was Darwin's key idea. The division of labour. And this doesn't got mentioned. People go on and on about Malthus. It's a side issue. Um, and this was it. And so he saw that nature worked in this way. But what he'd done is he'd put the division of labour into nature in this way. And that was his explanation. Of course, once you've got that, you're no, looking, no longer looking at the phenomenon directly, which shows this ubiquitousness of variation is life itself. And you've begun to think of it more in a mechanical kind of way. And that was the basis of Darwin's theory. Um, so he saw the same thing as Goethe. Where, he, where Goethe saw a duck, he saw a rabbit. So, so life has its aha moment, where it sees the form that its potency to be otherwise can realise. Yes. Mm. But of course that potency, that potency to be otherwise, is a potency It is not there already formed. Because mm. that would be finished product thinking. Mm. So, uh, I mean, I think this is interesting about Darwin. I bet you didn't know that. Did anyone know that? He knew it. Uh, the vague idea. The vague idea, yeah. Mm. People emphasise the wrong thing. They go on about Malthus. And they don't see what he... This, this factory division of labour, they don't realise that but, it was in his family. Mm. You know. I, really thought, I really knew that he had borrowed, I think, one of his most quoted... I've forgotten what it is actually, but it's um, a terminology that Adam Smith uh, uh, developed, and that was what became widely accepted within right. his evolutionary right. okay. body of work. That's mm. what I've understood. So yeah. this principle has been adopted by modern community ecology. We talk about the, the ecological niche, of course, of yes. the species, mm. and this thing called the competitive exclusion principle, which is the idea that no two species with identical niches. Can exist in the same habitat. Right. It's kind of looking at it the other way around. Yeah. But it comes to the same thing. It comes to the same thing, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 It's actually, and in that respect, down at the micro level, it, it's correct. So Darwin's not wrong. It's just that if you then say, and everything can be understood in this way, then you may have a problem, because it can't. And, and Dar Darwinians want to say, yes, it can. But that's different. If you look at the level where it operates, it's true. Uh, just one final thing on that. The, the famous Galapagos, Galapagos finches is a con. Um, he did bring these birds back, but actually he didn't see finches. He actually thought there were lots of different kinds of birds. There was, I've forgotten the types that are listed. He, he, there, was, there were some finches and then there were some other birds and some other birds. He didn't see finches. So all these variations of the finches, he didn't see that at all. He just saw a load of different birds. And they were drawn, because he then employed people to draw them, 
and there's a man called Gould, and he employed him to draw these uh, so that they could then go in books. And Gould said to him the next day, did you realise that these are all different kinds of finches? And Darwin hadn't done. But when it was pointed out to him, it did hit him what the significance could be. But how on earth could that happen when they're all there? Uh, of course, the other big thing was, uh, which is, I think it's terribly funny, um, you know, the, the Galapagos tortoises. Well, he was told by people um, there that they were different on different islands. And he thought if they were, that this was due to some minor circumstance or whatever. He took no notice of it. But they collected these tortoises and put them on board ship where they walked around till they killed them and ate them. Not very nice, is it? And then they chucked the carapace overboard. <coughs> well, when the finches thing happened, he suddenly realised, oh my God, those tortoises, that must have been the same thing. And of course, he'd, throw, he'd thrown the evidence overboard. So he threw the evidence for evolution overboard. I think that was terribly funny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, anyway, there we are. I just throw that in, I wasn't going to talk about that, but I do think it's interesting that there's potency to be otherwise Darwin himself came to through his work on the <coughs> barnacles and then took it in a different direction. So, uh, to finish off, uh, you could go on, couldn't you? We looked at the varieties of a single plant species so you could consider the different species within a genus and the different genera within a family in the same kind of way. And this can become a very enlivening experience uh, to see a particular family of plants <coughs> in the light of the idea of the dynamic unity of self-differencing. So because you begin to see the different kinds of plants as one plant being itself multiply instead of just different plants ex extensively. And anyone can learn to practice this for themselves. Uh, for example, you can take the different members of a family, say the Rosaceae family. That's the rose, the cherry, the apple, the blackberry, the strawberry. And you can begin to see these as one plant in the form of multiplicity and unity. And when you do that, learning to see in this way, as the consequence, you begin to see each member of the family reflected in all the others. So you see the rose, you can see the rose in the apple, and you can see the strawberry in the rose. But without any sense whatsoever that one kind of organism has ever turned into another. It's, quite an, it's a very enlivening thing to work in that way, because what you're seeing is the metamorphosis of one plant into different modes of itself and not the external change of one plant into another which brings us right back to what we said in the beginning and it's quite extraordinary this whole approach and we miss it because we look and we try to find an average plant we take these different plants and we say well let's find what they all have in common Let's find a kind of average plant, and that must be what is fundamental. And it can be useful to do that, but in fact it lacks the flexible and dynamic quality that is characteristic of life itself. And so it gives you a counterfeit of a living being, and not the living being. It's the very opposite of Goethe's approach, which he always said, we must make ourselves as mobile and flexible as nature herself in our minds. Well, I've summarised that, and to save you drawing it, here we are, my next extraordinary thing for you. Drawn carefully by my own hand last night. There we are. Thank you. It gives a summary of what I've been doing. In other words, it kills its own death. Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, the survival of the fittest. That was... Yeah, came uh, from Adam Smith. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Which is often misinterpreted to mean competition rather than the ability to produce offspring, which yes. is what Darwin means. Right, thank you. That's an important point. That becomes
because his all misinterpreted it in that way. Is that what I was saying? Of course, the later fetch phase, that wretched phase, nature read in tooth and claw, mm. that didn't come from Darwin, it came from Spencer. Because a lot of people writing books about evolutionary ideas at that time. Yeah. It's Spencer. Tencent. Tencent? No. Uh, well, well, it could be. He was a poet, anyway. anyway. <laughs> uh, that's the summary. Uh, that's it. And at that point, this point, I'd like to go home. Sure. But I can't go home <laughs> until Saturday morning. <laughs> so I'll have a cup of coffee instead. And then we'll come back and we'll do something else, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs>